Hey, everybody, welcome back. Try, time to grab your gear. Take to the road. As we chase down the entrepreneurs driving the e-bike revolution, talk to some of the love stories of those riding along. And today we're going to talk about how kind of a casual love story turned into a real commitment here to become an entrepreneur and a dealer in this movement. We're going to talk to two guys who started that journey just recently, right here in October, or uh, October and April, Scott Seneff and Travis Bryant. Uh, welcome, guys. We'll start with Scott here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And your partner, uh, Travis, welcome as well. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I, you know, this is going to be a little difficult for me today here because again, we're we're in that part of the country that uh, makes me see red. Uh, you're in Ohio, red, uh, red Ohio, and I grew up in blue Michigan, right next door here. So we'll try and keep it civil throughout this. But uh, uh, you guys are, have actually moved to the Columbus area, and uh, that's where your store is, right? Yep, right outside of uh, Columbus and Powell, Ohio. There you go. I know the area well here. And so, of course, you have your uh, University of Michigan flags up everywhere. And... They're everywhere. <laughs> they don't fire, but they're everywhere. They don't everywhere. stay up for very long, but they're up there. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I just thought this is a fascinating story here because you guys had both what? You've done lots of things in your life, sales for various companies, and you met because you were working for a large home improvement company, both of you, right, uh, in Columbus? Is that true, Scott? Yeah, it's probably been about eight years ago. Uh, uh, Travis started uh, in our former employer, and uh, I had been there for 19 years, and uh, uh, he kind of moved up through the ranks, and uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. So neither one of you came from a bike background. I don't see anything here that you were lifelong bikers. If anything, you were probably more into uh, motorcycles, right, Scott? Yeah, I uh, rode Harleys for... 20 years and uh, finally sold it last year once uh, once the electric bike thing started. <laughs> wow, boy, there's a statement for a Harley owner to give yeah. up the, the hog and to t and to hop on an e-bike. That says something about the enthusiasm you have for this whole thing here. All right. So, Travis, um, I'm hearing that uh, somehow was it you or was it Scott that discovered these things on a vacation? It was, I think it was you that was on a vacation somewhere oh, in Florida. Yeah, it was Scott. So Scott was down in uh, Florida in 30A, and, and uh, we had kind of talked about electric bikes a little bit, and he's sitting down there on a golf cart in front of the 30A store, <laughs> and there's the sign, you know? Yep, just getting ready to go in and get some groceries, and uh, we had bought electric bikes, a, a, a different brand, right. and uh, had not had them uh, delivered to us yet, but we knew the idea of them were you know something that was really going to take off and yeah. spitballing ideas and uh i happened to see the sign and a few weeks later kind of started to do some research were you looking to get into another world were you looking to be an entrepreneur and not work for somebody else scott was that part of the motivation for this i mean i'd always done some uh other things on the side i, I don't know that uh i was actively looking for anything but uh always kind of had my eye open for something uh, that I could get involved in. And, you know, that was the story last week. The dealer in Boulder, Colorado, was on a cruise down to Mexico. And her husband says, let's they get off in port in San Diego. She says, we got some time to kill. Let's rent an electric bike. Now, he kind of had an agenda because he'd been a hardcore bike enthusiast, and she'd never really written. She actually had, had born with a disability in her leg that from a kid that made it hard. She'd never ridden a bike, even as a kid. So she reluctantly goes along. And that not that afternoon experience turned into a life-changing thing talk about stumbling into you're at you're on a golf cart going to a what is it a Publix uh, the Publix is the big uh, grocery store chain down in Florida you're going to a Publix golf uh, grocery store and you see a dealer in the plaza uh, and why wander in why even go there I actually never went in believe it or <laughs> never not went in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I uh, like I said we we had uh order bikes and uh we just like the idea of them and we were spitballing ideas of like we always do yeah you know about random things we could start. over a cigar and whiskey anything can come up right that, that, a lot of stuff comes up over that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah we were i mean we talked tour companies we talked owning a shop but we had no idea where to start so 
it was kind of uh kind of was meant to be once i saw that sign and it's kind of like glowing. It's like in the movie, you hear this, you know, ta-da, and then this thing's glowing over the side, and you start going on the internet and checking this out. Why did you even think about getting an e-bike? What, what, what was the original impetus there? Just thought it would be fun, or you were thinking well, of I a business? I've asked Travis. I could blame all this on him. I'm not really sure I mean, how he started that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, at my previous job, I had gone to a customer's home, and they had an electric bike, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to him about it. You know, I hadn't been on a regular bicycle, and gosh... I don't know, probably eight, nine, ten years. Yeah, right. And, and uh, so I started doing a little bit of research, and then Scott, he, you know, he came down here from Akron. That's where he's from, mm -hmm. and one of his long lifetime friends up there actually had ordered one, unbeknownst to him. So he went up there for to visit him and sees an electric bike, and so we started doing some research, and before you know it, we both bought one. And did you know at the time that there was a company like Pedigo that didn't just sell them, but actually? had dedicated dealers that's that's the rare one of the rarities of pedigo you know everybody else is selling these things online like it's right. you know just something you get from amazon here in return if you don't like but it's a pretty big big thing to buy and to invest and if it doesn't work or you got to assemble it all these other things i think that's what people are so turned off when they get these things through the through the uh, mail through the internet yeah, I mean, we, we didn't know anything about that. And I think that's where a lot of misconceptions in the industry come from. So it's like, you know, we, we end up buying these bikes and, you know, shortly thereafter, hey, we needed service, yeah, right? right? And it's like, you know, your traditional bicycle shop, you call them and they say, oh, it has a motor on it. Yeah, sorry, we don't work on them. Yeah, right? right. So then you're stuck calling the manufacturer. So it's, you know, we started hearing this a lot. You know, we started doing some research. We start hearing this from other consumers that bought whatever brand of electric bike they had bought. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of stuck with this paperweight. You know, it's yeah, like. Right. Because if you can't fix it or you can't find the repart or you don't know how to assemble it or it just becomes so much of a hassle, it is a paperweight. It's like so many other things I bought over the Internet or over uh, television through the years, the rowing machine, the stationary bikes, all these things I got. And when I got it, it wasn't so easy to use. It wasn't so easy to assemble. And if something went wrong with it, I had a tendency to just put it aside and forget about it. And that, even if it was a big investment, I remember a rowing machine I bought. I think it's still sitting up in the rafters in my garage. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, so that's when, you know, once we really got into it and, and he saw that down there in Florida, and then we started having our own problems with, with, the brand of bike we had purchased, you know, then we're like, well, here's a, here's a problem that needs a solution. What did the other manufacturers say? I mean, cause it, these are bikes are, you know, thousand, couple yeah. thousand dollars or something here. These aren't sure. cheap things. And what do they say when you call you up? Or they just send you a YouTube video. Or here's how you fix it. Or here's what you do. Or we'll send uh, you, you know, the Funny enough. So it's, you know, we call them and, and uh, at first you get voicemails, you know, you don't get an actual <laughs> person. Oh, wow. Now. Uh, press one for for you know customer service and leave a voicemail we'll get back to you so yeah. you know you, you finally get a call back and next you know they say okay well we're going to send you this part we're not sure that this is going to fix it but we're going to send you this and so i i think scott was even sitting there we were in my my garage my lounge that we filled out and uh I, I say to the guy on the phone, I said, so where am i supposed to get this fixed yeah they said just call your local bike shop so and, I do, you and, know. And most and, of the bikes, I'm told, I, maybe it's not that way in, in Columbus, but I hear this all over the country, either they don't know how to deal with it because it has a motor on it, or they don't want to deal with it because they kind of see this as the enemy. This isn't what we sell. This isn't pure bike riding. Uh, you, we didn't sell it to you. We don't like the whole thing. Get away. Is that the kind of reaction you got? Definitely the kind of reaction we got. And even from customers who come in the store here they're who have shopped at other bike shops it's almost like they don't even want to sell their own electric bike here in town it's it's yeah. very odd so. yeah so here's this growing enthusiasm for a product that uh seems to have certainly started with at least with pedigo's case the the aging baby boomer like me the person who hadn't been on a bike in a while william shatner's story 90 years old hadn't ridden a bike in years but now he wants to get out and get active and he needs a little help as he says i need a little assist to go over the humps in the hills to get over that objection of why i can't go bike riding today here uh, and i want to keep up with my grandkids and whatnot all these and then and from there now i see kids in my neighborhood right who's riding them in in columbus these days here is it everybody or is it still targeted towards an older demographic 
and I'll throw it to either one of you. You guys, it's can. everybody. I mean, uh, we had uh, somebody as young as eleven years old buy one, and wow. uh, he bought one, and uh, five or six of his friends now ride. We can look out the window here and probably see him cruise by here soon. And as old as eighty nine years old. So, eighty nine. Uh, wow. Isn't that it? What are the nine year old guys showed up before we even opened the store uh, and uh, wanted to buy one? And uh, he was uh, one of our first two or three customers we had. So I can't think of too many products that have that wide of a demographic. Uh, I think of most products as a point in your life. I had the heavy duty mountain bike when I was in my 30s or 40s because I was pushing myself. Um, I had a bike when I was a little kid, but all of that got put away a long time ago, and I didn't think about I thought bike riding was behind me here. It seems to be something that you start with as a kid to get out and adventure and to get away and to go see stuff, and then at some point you almost come back full circle to, I want to get out of the house, I want to get out and with my friends, I want to go see stuff. Uh, is it that? Is it just kind of a lifelong obsession about adventure and going seeing what's over the next hill, guys? What do you think? I mean, are you talking personally or from our, from our customers? Let's start personally, because you guys had a personal passion, I mean, reason to buy these things here. Yeah, I mean, personally, you know, the biggest thing was is the, the job that we both had. I mean, it was it was a pretty demanding job from a time aspect, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we were working, especially myself. I mean, Scott had made his way up to a management position and, and could work not weekends anymore, but yeah. still had to be on call basically all week long at any time of the day and still on the weekends. But, you know, it's, uh, so the biggest thing for us was, is we just wanted to be able to get out and do something. You know, he has a, he has twin boys. I have, uh, I have a three-year-old son and, you know, at the time he'd put his kids to bed and uh, him and his wife and my wife and I'd put my kid to bed and we lived close enough. We'd go out and explore, you know, wherever at, eight o'clock at night till yeah. 11, 12 o'clock. Go for a walk, yeah. take a drive, go somewhere here. Yeah, yeah. Right, whatever. I'll throw it back to the other half of the team here. What What was your experience? What What was your personal reason for wanting to do this? Just to get away, to get out again and get active? He mentioned my boys, you know, that they, they were starting to ride bikes. You know, they were four at the time, five now. And, um, you, you know, I just wanted to be able to do something with them. I had a couple uh, bikes that had just you know rotted away in my shed that I, I bought eight <laughs> right. years before, brand new, uh, nice bikes, and never rode them, and uh, just looking for something to get out to do with them. Once they got on the bikes and we started carting them around town, uh, they loved them, so it just kind of made it easier to transition and you know, to wanting one myself. So. And are people doing it for other reasons? We don't hear a lot of it, but we've heard some of it where people start off commuting. There was a guy in London who actually be, ended up becoming a dealer. He worked for the, I think he was a colonel in the Air Force and procurement or something, he worked for the American Embassy in London. And he said it was just a nightmare trying to get through London traffic. So for him, getting a bike was an easy way to get around. And then it became fun because he's going down the the off alleys and lanes and past the pubs and all the other things that otherwise he would be just sitting in traffic ignoring. Is is any of that in this too? I don't know what it's like in Columbus if it's bike friendly, but do people use these to get around? Yeah, there's quite a few people who are buying them just for their commute, work and back. It's pretty bike friendly. I mean, it's not the most scenic route around here, but uh, there are definitely bike paths that uh, people are using them for. Any practical uses? We've heard people in Houston talk about cops using them instead of horses now and for crowd control or of uh, somebody in Texas, somebody where you're using them for search and rescue kind of things to get off the beaten paths or to cover a lot of ground quickly and because these are out hill country and people are out hiking, they get lost or something here. Any any other unusual uses other than just fun and uh, commuting? That you guys I'd say the most unusual use would probably be hunting. Hunting? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, why uh, didn't I think of that? This is Ohio and Michigan. This is hunting country it's, back there. Yeah. <laughs> It's becoming pretty popular because uh, a lot of the places these people go, they can't take their four wheelers and uh, disturb the, the land. Sure. And they're loud, so they're using these as a quiet mode uh, to get where they got to go. And you want to sneak up on the deer. You don't want to come racing in with a ATV, a four wheeler here, and scare everything away for the next twenty four hours here, right? Yeah. 
Well, uh, that's obvious. Okay, so you've got now. Uh, hear that, Don? We need a hunting bike here for. <laughs> for we are actually in that process of, of working on some mounts for some of these hunters around here. There like you go. Little yep. Mounts and things like that. Yeah, and and a way to secure the, the guns and uh, so it doesn't exactly. fall off and go off or something here, and it's locked. Somebody's not going to take it if you leave the bike for a second here. I mean, I can think of all sorts of crazy things. I I wasn't a hunter myself, but boy, I was the exception. Everybody back there, when hunting season hits, the whole t- towns would clear out uh, in Michigan, and I'm assuming Ohio too, in Pennsylvania, that whole area that's just hunting crazy out there. My brother-in-law was Hotels just... Hotels are booked. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and then it's... A, 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 half the time, it's just having cigars and whiskeys and sitting up in a cabin somewhere. I don't know how much hunting actually goes on, but uh, you, you get out and you get into the wilderness there. That's really uh, is important. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then in the winter, it's uh, fishing. Why not go? Why not take these out onto the lake and go uh, ice fishing as well here? Why not? Right. Take your gear. But yeah, if you could grab all your gear and go further and get way out, um, why not? Absolutely. Because otherwise, you are trying to drag all this stuff in and out here. All right, so that's an unusual one here. Um, what is it like in the winter? When Don first got me involved in this and said, I want you to host this, and I thought, well, this is all going to be sunshine states. This is all going to be beach communities like it is here in Southern, I think it started here in Southern California along the beaches here. Don's first shop was along the beach here. Uh, and now we have them. Um, stories talking about Canada or British Columbia and and Michigan and Ohio. It snows, believe me, buddies. That's why I left there 100 years ago. Way too much snow for me back there. What do you do with your pedigo in the winter? Well, we'll let you know after this winter. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, we, A little premature here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about that. You know, I think what, what we've really been telling a lot of our customers currently is, is you know, hey, you're, you're buying your bikes. Most of our people are buying bikes from us at the beginning of the spring, now into the summer. Sure. Hey, bring them back in for service when it's snowing. You know, so we're going to we're gonna try to really get really service busy. But also, I think we're going to do some winter tours. Um, yeah. You know, do some snow riding if we can get some snow. Work on getting people out there. Because I think, you know, that's that's a big thing around here. You know, you grew up in Michigan. After a long after a long winter, you're tired of being in the house. Oh, absolutely. You know? uh, they always said, you know, when summer finally hits in that part of the world, yeah. I don't care if you've got a cold or if you feel tired, you're getting outside because it's only going to last a couple months here. So, damn it, we're going to get in the boat. We're going to go for a walk. We're going to go ride a bike. We're going to be outdoors and enjoy it. I don't care, kids, if you don't want to do this. It's it's nice out. We're going outside. We're not sitting inside. It's 45 we're, degrees. We're going outside now. Yeah. I've been sitting inside too long. I'm going yeah. outside every day for as long as I can. So I'll yeah. bet a lot of people would ride bikes in the winter. Uh, I guess that would have to be a fat tire bike to, to handle it, more like a trail bike That's or something. Plan. You know, we're going we're gonna to really start uh, trying to nail down the details as we get closer to the winter here because – you know, fortunately, in Columbus anymore, it doesn't, most of the time, it doesn't get real, real cold yeah. in November, you know, so yeah. it's, uh, we, we've got some time there, but I think, I think that we'll be able to put something together and be pretty successful um, from a, from a tour aspect and, and, and that ultimately will help, you know, get more people on bikes. Well, uh, I know it's snowmobile country. Everybody gets on their snowmobiles. And uh, why not get on your e-bikes as well? Get out and get active and get out there. Because anything you can do to get out of the house, that's that's the number one thing. When you've been sitting month after month back there, uh, it, you can definitely get uh, stir crazy sitting in the house too long here. So you have to come back on and tell us how that works. Because I think uh, I, I've been afraid to ask other dealers in other parts of the country, but I, I figure you guys, we can we can talk how it really is. It's cold back there. I don't know if Columbus gets as cold as Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor was the worst. They get uh, yeah. off the lake and and that kind of belt that runs all the way over to Chicago. There we get massive. I, again, I haven't been there in a hundred years, so maybe it's not as bad as it used to be to get pretty deep snow out in that whole area where I grew up and where I went to school. And yet people would get out. Like you said, it, it would get up to 45 degrees and everybody's out in shorts like it's warm. summer. Yeah, it's warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hard for people to grasp that anymore. If it goes down to 65, I got the heat out of my house now here. I'm in Southern right. California. Right. You know, I can't take this. 
All right, so here's the most surprising stat in all the stuff they showed me here. He opened the store on April 2nd. I appreciate you waited one day so it wouldn't be April Fool's, but you opened up the... This... It's actually why we did that. Yeah. <laughs> Is it really? I figured so. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be forever known as the April Fool's here. Oh, those crazy guys, they opened a bike shop here. What an e-bike shop. But since then, they tell me that in terms of sales of the couple hundred dealers around the country, you guys have been in the top 10 and in June, even went so high as number one in the country. What is the secret? You guys never sold e-bikes before. This isn't uh, what I picture the heart of e-bike country outside of Columbus. What is the secret sauce? Tell us. That's the million-dollar question. We <laughs> That's the question Don wanted me to ask more than any other. How the <laughs> heck are you doing it back there? <laughs> I just shared with them the other day. I think it's just the background we come from and uh, trying to create an experience for the people when they come in, where it's more of conversation um, and, and just having fun, just learning about these bikes in a different way than a, a traditional bike shop. I think we just have a lot of fun with the people when they come in. That combined with the knowledge, I mean, we, we knew a lot about electric bikes before we even started just mm -hmm. based on our journey to, to this whole thing. So it, it seems like we've been doing this for 10 years. and sounds like it but uh, we really haven't so. any trouble learning the product you guys what i'm told are tinkerers by by trade sort of i mean you were in what would you call it home improvement so this is like what uh, building out basements or yeah, something I mean, here? we were in sales i mean our nails never got dirty but okay you know but travis though he's the tinker he grew up uh, his, his family owned an auto body shop and that's what he did uh, for years so he could change you know a diesel engine on a truck so learning a 749 watt motor is pretty pretty easy. Pretty so. piece of cake. So what do you think, Travis? Did it come? Because that's I think one of the intimidations when people get into the business. We've had a lot of them on this show. Almost yeah. none of them have a bike background. I mean, very few of them. They all come from some other second act career: airline pilot, uh, bank president, uh, a Wall Street uh, bond trader. I mean, there's just some of the real people that have uh, stumbled into opening an e-bike store here. Most of them kind of a second act career, something fun, uh, something a little more mom and pop uh, oriented. They wanted to be an entrepreneur. They want something that's fun. That seems to be one of the key. But is it intimidating to sell a product that does have gears and motors and stuff to it? I mean, especially not for me. You know, the, the biggest thing I can, I tell everybody and everybody that comes in the store, they get, you know, they look at it, they go, oh, so you guys do the sale. You guys do, you guys do the repair here too. You guys do that yourself. And they look at me and I go, yeah, I mean, you know, I, my folks, they, they opened up an auto body repair shop and mechanical shop. I mean, gosh, I had to be four or five years old when they <laughs> opened that up. So I, I always say, you know, I grew up with a, with a wrench in one hand and a screwdriver in the other. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I'd take anything apart and put it back together. And if I didn't know how, I figured it out. And I hear more and more people, the dealer in Boulder, this woman who had been in academia, she's a she has a doctorate in like educational equity or some field of, to me, strange field of study here. But she was a dean and all stuff. She wasn't a tinker. She wasn't a, she was an academic. But when they got the bite and decided to take the plunge, she said, I've learned how to fix these things. She said, that's one of the f most fun things I like to do is go in the back and tinker with these. She, she said, who knew? I never played with anything. Is it, is, it a, is it fun to fix them? It is fun to fix them at this point, you know, because I've even told Scott, you know, when I was, it was frustrating when you were working on automobiles because it's very tight, you know, tight yeah, areas right. and not a lot of room to work with, at least on a bicycle, you know, it's mechanical for the most part. Oh, so it's yeah. like, hey, if something doesn't work, I'm going to figure out why. And it's, and it's, it is fun for me to figure that out. So it's kind of the thrill of, you know, learning something new and, and, uh, and working with my hands again. And I'll tell you what I would, cause I'm not a tinker. I'm not, uh, you'd have to, uh, I could work with a screwdriver, but you'd have to point out what one looks like in the toolbox here for me to, you know, try it. But I found that even I have an old 56 Plymouth, I'm from Michigan. Of course I have to have an old car here. And I can work on it a little bit. And, be, and there's room, there's space. When I open up the hood, I can see the parts. 
when I open up a hood today, I, it's just one big, massive part. I can't even see beyond the surface. I can't see where all the computers and all the stuff stuck together. So it's so yeah. complex. I can't work on I fiz, Even if I wanted to, I couldn't work on it. A bike yeah. seems to be kind of old school, old fashioned. There's a gear. There's a something, you know, yeah. there's a chain. One part makes the other part work. Yeah, you know? right. This this does this and makes this other thing work. Well, it seems like the two of you have made this work somehow here from uh, 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 just kind of a, a hoot and, a, and an afternoon, uh, an evening pursuit, sitting around with a cigar in one hand and a glass of whiskey in the other. I Believe me, I've spent many nights back in the Midwest at probably sitting around a fireplace somewhere, too, uh, and uh, just talking. You've turned it into reality, and not just any business. Sounds like a really thriving, growing business. My my hats off to both of you. Where does it go from here? Last question. Any thoughts to uh, right now? Do you even have employees? Is it just the two of you? <laughs> Funny you say that. We just printed off at least forms to hire an employee. <laughs> See, I knew that. We finally got run payroll service set up. So that's, <laughs> that's next on the agenda, and uh, I believe uh, we're going to start uh, looking around for our uh, second location here around Columbus uh, to open next spring. Wow, it's a beautiful town. It is a college town, so I would think college towns, is that an easier place? Are there more people because you got students trying to travel across campus. We had the, there's a guy that owns a store. We talked to him across from Stanford up here in Northern California, and he said he didn't expect it, but he gets a lot of professors and football players and other people that are picking up e-bikes because they want to get around the sprawling campus. Uh, and then there are other corporate campuses nearby. It's nearby Google sprawling campus. And people are they're out walking these things. Why not take an e-bike and make it even easier and quicker to get around? Any of that? Because Ohio State's a pretty big campus. We haven't had any uh, cam campus uh, uh, people in here yet. I, I think we're a little far away. But our next store will be more geared towards downtown area more than likely so. i think that's a market you should look at because i he this guy said it was the unexpected find in his backyard he he opened up and across some stamp because he thought you know it's affluent and silicon valley and all that he didn't think that he literally had has had football players and stuff at e-bikes and that's how they get around campus who knows all right well okay it's hard for me to say the word O H I O, so I'll just spell it. But my hats off to you guys for seeing an opportunity and jumping on it and for doing as much with it as you had. And I would definitely love to have you guys come back when winter hits and to find out if you've been able to. Uh, do you have to shut the store down in the winter? We had a dealer up in, I think it's like northern Michigan somewhere, and that's literally what they do. It's like Petoskey or someplace. It's a seasonal business for them, uh, like so many things are up in that area. Or is there a way to run tours and get people out? I'll bet there is, because people love to be out in the snow. They are not. They don't want to sit inside all the time, so why not? I think there's a, I'll bet there's a business to be built around that. Yep, we're uh, we're pretty, you know, we're pretty uh, excited to see how that goes. So All right, we'll know when we get there. All right, you know? just don't do it any time around the Michigan Ohio State game, whenever that plays out here, because uh, <laughs> you guys have been crushing us for too long. I don't want you to crow any more about how dominant you've been over Michigan for the last hundred years or whatever it's been right. here. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, for joining us here. We have Scott Seneff. And Travis Bryant, uh, two of the newest dealers in the Pedigo uh, uh, lineup here. And it sounds like they're hitting it out of the park down in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks for coming on the show, guys. Thank Thanks. You. Appreciate it. All right. Well, there you have it. If that's not another reason to tune in, I don't know what is. As we ride along with the entrepreneurs who are making this up as they go along, driving the e-bike revolution in directions nobody ever knew. Maybe with snow tours. Stay tuned. We'll see what's next on the Pedigo Podcast. 